And now we have a new panel coming up. Uh, again, uh, a very interesting uh, group of specialists, people who've had experience in the field. Uh, we are very excited and very grateful for their participation. Uh, and allow me to uh, present the moderator for this session. It's Colonel Barbara Fick. She is an international affairs specialist focused on Latin American issues, including US policy for Latin America and the Caribbean, Western Hemisphere defense and security affairs, and multinational and transregional cooperation. Currently, Colonel Fick is the director of the Americas program and serves as a professor in the Department of National Security Strategy at the US Army War College. Barbara, it's great pleasure seeing you again. I'm uh, honored to be to call you my friend. We thank you very much for your work. And also, I welcome our panelists today. Without further ado, I give you the floor so that you can present the panelists. And uh, let's move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It's an honor to be here and truly an honor to uh, moderate this panel of such distinguished experts uh, in, in the region. Um, uh, I will first introduce them with some highlights from their biographies, though I wanna read it all because they have done so many amazing things. And then I'll give a quick intro to our panel topic, the future of the armed forces in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, looking at the roles of the armed forces. And then um, we'll turn it over to our panelists. I'll open with a question and let them go and we'll follow up with a couple of questions. I may take uh, my prerogative as moderator to ask the first question before turning it over to our uh, those who are online. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce our first uh, panelist, uh, General Alberto Jose Mejia Ferrero. The, he's the former Colombian ambassador to Australia and New Zealand and a retired general in the Colombian army. He served as the commander of military forces in Colombia from 2017 to 2018 and has had many major posts, which is an absolute understatement. He has served in key posts in the Colombian military, in the army uh, throughout the um, height of the conflict with the FARC and his the successes he led brought the country to the uh, final peace accords. Um, he is considered an expert in irregular and asymmetrical warfare, as well as in fourth generation wars, special operations, and civic action operations. Uh, he's recognized at nationally and internationally for his work in human rights and international humanitarian law, which were really critical to the successes Colombia has had. And uh, he has, as the ambassador to Australia and New Zealand, he has served uh, with to work on the interest in the Pacific Alliance and participated in as an adjunct professor in Canberra, Australia. Uh, he is currently the honorary president of the Australia Columbia Business Council. And second, uh, we have uh, General Rocky Mead from Jamaica, uh, re retired from the as the Jamaica's chief of defense staff uh, after th a 38 year service. Uh, General Mejia at 41 years. Um, General Mead uh, is his achievements include enhancement of the JDF's personnel, resources, and infrastructure from brigade level to division. Uh, many policies, including, and as we mentioned before, uh, gender optimization in the Jamaican Defense Forces, uh, the Jamaica National Service Corps, Caribbean Military Academy, and, and a flight safety program. Um, it, it really goes on. He has published um, in numerous fora and also uh, advises PhD students in strategic studies and linguistics. General Meade holds a BA and MA degrees from the University of, West, of the West Indies and a Master of Mil Military Arts and Science from Command and General Staff College. Uh, he also has a PhD from the University of Amsterdam 
and is an alumnus of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany. Very transregional. Uh, we're very fortunate to have both Generals Meade and General Mejia uh, with us. And last, Admiral Craig Fowler is a senior fellow at Florida International University and uh, my former boss and, and also former commander of US Southern Command. He's a retired four-star Navy Admiral uh, and he has also nearly four decades of global leadership experience. He is a distinguished fellow at the Atlanta Council's Adrian Arsht uh, Latin American Center and the Snowcroft Center for Strategy and Security and a senior fellow at National Defense University. Um, I, I think uh, those who know Admiral Fowler know that he was instrumental in fostering partnerships in the region, and that was a key focus during his command at U.S. Southern Command. Uh, in, in the Navy, he has also served uh, in the Middle East. He's commanded a Navy carrier strike group and two warships, and has extensive experience in Washington, D.C., um, not the least of which is senior military advisor to the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis at the time, and also serving uh, in the Navy's uh, legislative uh, office. And with that, I will turn to talk about our topic. We have, with this distinguished panel, uh, it, we're sure to have some very good conversation. And quite frankly, I think we'll get at some of the questions and items that uh, uh, our Deputy Assistant Secretary Erickson mentioned in his remarks or that we didn't get to answer uh, in the last session. So first I wanna, you know, when we talk about the role of the armed forces, there's really two aspects. There's the civil military relationships and also the concepts of defense and security, which um, Mr. Erickson already raised and, and more and more they are very in, intertwined ideas. Um, you know, historically, in, in Latin America, uh, the, the militaries, the armed forces, Latin America and the Caribbean, I want to make sure I don't forget the Caribbean, uh, it's probably best to say the Americas, uh, in the southern part of the Western Hemisphere, the uh, militaries have played a prominent role uh, in politics, either as a part of the governing body or uh, very influential. And in that during the 19th and 20th century, um, they were very dominant in the affairs. At times, the military even seized power to quote unquote, save the countries from threats to political, uh, to st stability. Uh, and, and before the 60s, military coups actually were a form of transition uh, st and stability. And you see the countries kind of going back and forth between uh, a military coup, then some transition to democracy, followed by a military coup. And, and this is a general uh, statement. Uh, between the 60s and 90s, we saw more uh, military-led governance, uh, in, in many cases, dictatorships. Um, and during this period, there were certainly a number, and, and um, this will likely come up in our conversations, there were human rights violations, uh, the societies were more polarized, and it, it led to a transition to democracy, putting the, the role of the military sort of in a new, uh, on, on new grounds. Uh, after the 90s, uh, well, by 1990, Cuba was the only remaining uh, true dictatorship. And in this period of democracy, when democracy blossomed or flourished in the region, as we thought, um, the new re rulers uh, sought to redefine the roles of, of these military institutions, as did the military institutions. Um, and it was really historic. And I'm, I'm gonna quote, uh, I think some of you know, uh, Frank Mora and Brian Fonseca. I'm gonna quote an article they wrote in 2019 in America's Quarterly. Uh, Today, many Latin American militaries continue to search for a purpose, uncertain of their identity, their mission and place in society. Okay, and I think that, that will probably draw some interesting commentary. But, but if we look at the strategic landscape today, generally speaking, it's described as a peaceful region 
there is very little threat of state on state violence. And in some countries, uh, the, the population or the, the governing bodies question why they have a military or why they're investing uh, in the military. So you see some defense budgets that are not as high as they once were. At the same time, threats and challenges in the region are considerable. The region has been characterized as the most, one of the most violent, if not the most violent in, in the world. Uh, challenges in terms of obviously crime, uh, transnational uh, illicit activity, including violent crime, violence, poverty, and equality. And you know, some of the new things were, we've always dealt with natural disasters, uh, and, but we're really more aware of it with our understanding of climate change uh, and some of the humanitarian crises that are driven by those disasters, those changes in climate that affect often the, the poorest in society. Um, so these are not, these crises don't seem like a part of defense, not necessarily armed forces uh, missions, however, or traditional defense missions, they have often been beyond the capabilities of other institutions in the governments. So the militaries have been called upon. And, and I, I would also note that um, the militaries by and large are the most trusted institution in many countries in the region. So it, it leads to this increasing tendency to call on the armed forces where other institutions cannot address this complex, really widespread of challenges that affect the well-being of the population and, and also the stability. Um, in some cases, uh, well, some examples we see would be where the military has been called to take on more of an internal security role, not strictly defense role. Um, good example would be the, the federal operation in Rio de Janeiro, where the military was called in to um, as they say, pacify the favelas in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and that was a temporary measure. And we've seen temporary measures uh, in the case of the pandemic uh, to secure the streets or the, the recent unrests in 2019 in Colombia, Chile, uh, and, and a few other countries. Um, again, many examples where this has occurred. And uh, Desdi Erickson mentioned a few as well in, in, in his uh, comments. So we, we see a lot of things happening, the military, the armed forces being called out, very often overlapping with the roles of other institutions, uh, often within the bonds, binds of the constitution, but as temporary measures. And the question is, are, they, are these roles going to be temporary? Um, or should there be new authorities or different authorities, different protections uh, developed? So 21st century complexity, all of the things I've just mentioned that have, that have been going on, but we've got hyperconnectivity, interconnectedness, uh, and this is global, global in good and bad ways. Um, we can look at, we have a lot of, we have more extra hemispheric actors in the region uh, with more influence than before. And it can be good, it can be bad. Uh, we have seen examples, and it's already been alluded to, uh, some of China's activity is not necessarily good for the America's community, including the US, but also in the best interest of our neighbors to the South. Um, Interconnectivity in terms of uh, supply chains uh, is very important. We've seen uh, the Western in the Western Hemisphere some of the economic issues have related to commodities-based economies, where they've been uh, the economic well-being of each country is dependent upon the commodity prices. So it's very volatile. Uh, so this is something we can think about as we look at supply chains globally. Um, and how we deal with extra, uh, some of the other regions working with our, uh, our countries in the region. And the other issue that, that really complicates it further, information and disinformation. I've mentioned extra hemispheric actors, uh, disinformation uh, coming out of some media outlets and, and 
uh, I will mention Russia, uh, is, is very common, it's widespread. And then we look at uh, cybersecurity, space, digitalization, uh, the, the digitalization gap in the region. And on, there is basically the digital divide parallels to some extent, it's another form of inequality. Um, so so it, it, it's kind of a mess, a soupy mess. Um, we need to recognize this new complex strategic environment and really the environment's always been complex, but we've got new elements there uh, that are changing perhaps how we should look at our armed forces and how we should carefully define their roles. Um, so, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists to answer an opening question, either generally or based on their country's unique experiences. Uh, are we defining the roles of the armed forces correctly? Uh, do we need to be more fluid? If so, how? And, and what are or sh what are they actually, the roles of the armed forces, and what should they be for the 21st century going forward? I know that was a multi-part question, but it, I was really just clarifying this. Are we defining the roles correctly? What should they be? So I'll, I'll turn it over. I'll, um, I'll go uh, first with, um, actually, does anyone want to volunteer? I'm going to go with uh, Admiral Fowler first to speak generally about the region, and hopefully uh, with General Meade and General Mejia, they might give some more uh, country perspective-based uh, comments. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Colonel Barbara Fick, uh, for moderating and your excellent opening remarks. It's an honor to be here with my colleagues and friends. Uh, uh, General Ambassador Mejia and uh, General Rocky Mead, who we did such good work together on partnerships. And when uh, you said it, the key word is trust. And when you have trusted professionals like Alberto and Rocky to work with day in and day out, a, a lot can be accomplished. But as you've articulated, a lot more needs to be done. And, uh, and that's really the heart of your question, defining the right roles. Uh, there needs to be a, a really good approach for that. Um, I'd like to also thank Florida International University for hosting this, the Jack D. Gordon Institute for the great work they do in championing the hemisphere. I guess I start by democracies must deliver and professional militaries have a key place in delivering security for our populations. Uh, we see daily the cost of underinvesting in these professional militaries uh, and it's playing out right now in uh, the Ukraine uh, which could have been preventable if the right things have been done. And hindsight's always 2020, but but clearly uh, more could have been done. It should have been done. We have to afford security. The price of um, of when deterrence fails is is high. We, we're seeing that again. Every nation of the world, and so in our neighborhood, the Caribbean and Latin America, and, and neighborhoods are defined by the values we share, and that's what's so great about these trusted partners. In our neighborhood, we must recognize that our security is interconnected and intertwined globally. And we've got to approach it that way. Russia, China, I, I disagree with the previous speaker. Uh, I'm a realist with respect to China, but I'm an alarmist with respect to the, what the PRC is up to. And we've got to do more working together. Uh, so defining the right roles, uh, more needs to be done to invest in the security of our militaries. And that starts with professional. And so I'm really going to hit four framing things I think that would guide the development of enhanced uh, security in our militaries globally and in this hemisphere moving forward. So professionalism is number one, and that's education that focuses on doing the right thing, human rights, uh, the use of the armed conflict, the rules of armed conflict, and that has been baked in to military training across the hemisphere, and particularly noteworthy for what Jamaica is doing leading the Caribbean and the regional training centers and education centers and in Colombia, where the US Columbia Action Plan, Columbia is a regional leader and their NATO partnership also makes them a global leader. So professionalism is number one. The second one is integrated solutions. So we've, and each nation has its own laws, but integrated solutions, both bilaterally, multilaterally, and then in joint interagency type relationships in the US, I look at Joint Interagency Task Force South and JIATF as a model for that. 
but that it, that requires more emphasis across the board in our war in our exercises our war games our education and in uh, in the day-to-day -day discussions the third is what i would call the four e's of of uh of the bilateral relationships one that is engagement i hear people say well we don't gauge for engagement's sake and that's baloney we need to engage continuously dialogue across all levels that's how we build trust and understand engagement matters engagement produces results the second is education i mentioned it previously we should double down every nation should effective immediately based on the lessons of the ukraine crisis the putin's war double their investment in military education and training. It's an investment in the future. And I'm glad we did that with the Ukrainian Armed Forces uh, as we see their will to fight and professionalism play out daily. The third is exercise. I said there's there's four E's here, exercises. Again, that should double down on the, the budgets for exercises because that's where you take your education, your training, and you apply it on the field and put bilateral relationships into multilateral uh, results. And then the fourth is equipment. Uh, investing in commonality and equipment matters from communications gear to cyber to uh, to type of kit that we use and train. It doesn't all have to be American made either, right? It's just everybody, every country brings something to that fight. We've got to, we've got to ensure that we're interoperable and we have good equipment. The final thing I said, there was, was really four things, professionalism, integrated solutions, this idea of engagement exercises, education and equipment and then the final one is intel sharing intel drives everything and and if we really trust each other we're going to uh, open our policies up and increase our authorities and in intel training so these are really the the areas that need more emphasis in defining our military uh, relationships they're solid but more needs to be done and we see the results of not doing enough early enough in the global crisis that we face so thanks Okay, excellent. Um, I'll, I'll go to uh, General Mead to follow up. Uh, what What are your thoughts on the armed forces, uh, the role of the armed forces? What What are they? What should they be? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fick. I want to start by thanking the FIU um, and our chair, President Solis, it was good to see uh, Dazzy Erickson and my fellow panelists, um, Admiral Fala, General Mayer. Um, this is really an important engagement and I, I thank you for including me. Uh, so are we defining the roles correctly? I would say yes for the most part, but a big but. And that can go to the other part of your question, what should they be? And in a nutshell, they should be a lot more dynamic. And so it, it, there is um, an article by uh, Desola 2016 in um, defining a dynamic global environment um, where, um, you know, demographic shifts are mentioned, social cohesion and trust, hybrid and asymmetric threats, technological innovation and the challenges that brings resources, uh, climate management and security, efficient governance, and of course, geostrategic competition. So, the, you know, while we have done a reasonable job collectively of defining what we should do, we need to continue to be dynamic. And so the answer to that question will always be a yes to some extent, but not enough. Uh, so I would like to emphasize um, with your good introduction, uh, Dr. Fick and Admiral Fallas' uh, points, I think what I'd like to throw in there is the unique status of small island developing states. The, the fact of the matter is that we have no choice. We do not have the luxury because of just limited budget. We do not have the luxury of focusing exclusively on traditional defense activities, even if it made sense to do that. And I'm not sure it does uh, since um, many of the challenges we face, especially the man-made challenges have, for example, financial and economic interests that drive what they do, which cause a, a defense and security problem. So often the small island defense uh, developing states 
have to focus on the military as the only multi-capability resource they have that can not only deal with uh, defense, but can treat with uh, natural challenges, man-made challenges, including crime. In Jamaica, um, we have a particular problem. I think it is uh, uh, the Erickson that mentioned the, um, the uh, homicide rates or indirectly mentioned the homicide rates in this region. We are, you know, we're leaders in the region in terms of violence. And this plays out very significantly in Jamaica. And in terms of a regional concern, small arms impact our domestic security. And of course, we, we know that there are some healthy discussions that can be had about the sources and movement of small arms, but this is something we have to be conscious of. Uh, in Jamaica, what we did, and of course we don't represent the entire Caribbean, but we did a review and a strategic defense review and a 20 year plan uh, when I started my tenure. So we had a 2017 to 2037 strategic uh, development um, review that was updated last year because of COVID. And in it, we redefined our doctrine in light of the dynamic environment I mentioned before. We did significant restructuring, as was mentioned in my intro and expansion. We have expanded and enhanced our capabilities. We are focused on resilience, including health type uh, resilience issues, but we also have to be concerned with other areas. Dr. Fick mentioned other institutions and agencies Recently, we had to be supporting the country during industrial action by some um, essential services. We, we have to be concerned with that. We are certainly heavily focused on education, generally professional military education, youth engagement, gender optimization was mentioned. Um, but to the, more to the point of the, this um, uh, panel, um, we think partnerships are important. Partnerships are important. And we have recognized in our strategic defense review our role in the region. So if you get a look at it, you will see that we heavily support, um, we heavily support the um, um, development of the region um, and the other Caribbean states. Maritime domain awareness, we share resources there. Uh, HADR, we have teams on standby to help. We're helping with cyber and professional military education. And then what we try to do, as I try to wrap up here, is to collaborate with our larger partners to help us help our other Caribbean partners. If that, that's a mouthful, I hope it makes sense. I was very pleased to note that although the US is very necessarily focused outside the region, that more than one representatives of the government emphasize that the White House realizes that it needs to, um, you know, um, uh, reinforce uh, its attention to the region because U.S. security is inextricably linked to regional security. I was very happy to hear that. Um, and of course, I think that we can't depend on friendships only. Friendships are important, but what we need to do is to align national interests. Um, and our alignment of interest is that we have a shared value system anchored in democracy. And I just want to close by saying that it is in the interest, in my humble opinion, of the more able democracies to support the less capable democracies. So it is very clear to the world that democracy works. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay, yeah, great, great um, a point about democracy. I, I think we'll want to pull the thread some more on that. Uh, but I'll, I'll pass the, the mic to General Mejia uh, for his uh, first volley. Barbara, hello. It's Good great morning. to see you. Thank you very much for your introduction and, and a special hello to uh, President Solis, Amir Toller, General Mead, and all my dear friends at the Jack D. Gordon Institute of Public Policy and the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center. Thank you for this invitation to this panel about the future of armed forces in Latin America and the Caribbean. One of the main questions directed to this panel is how do we see the 
the mission of Latin American and Caribbean armed forces changing over the next five to seven years. Of course, the ability to predict the future is one of the most pressing difficulties for government and national security institutions. However, I do believe that it's easier to predict the future of institutions within democratic governments. That is why Latin American and Caribbean uh, uh, armed forces, uh, uh, democratic armed forces will continue to fight against 21st century security challenges in their path to support democratic consolidation. I want to approach the question at hand from a very pragmatic perspective. In my view, there are three specific areas that we, will allow Latin American and Caribbean armed forces to become stronger, more professional, and to serve their democracies with resolute principles and values. Number one is professional military leadership development. With the support of the US and a coalition of the willing countries, we need to boost professional military education in the hemisphere. This would require that courses at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels be developed to reach the whole region. The US has done a fantastic work using its IMED program and course portfolio that are being offered to its allies globally. However, the reach of these efforts is limited because of the lack of resources and the low level of bilingualism in the region. Another important challenge is related to long distance education, which is still far from reaching all audiences. Using a unified certification scale will help these programs to reach more leaders and would have greater institutional impact in the region. Finally, there are many countries in the region that have developed excellent institution and world-class programs. So we should take advantage of them as well. Several can become Latin American and Caribbean excellent centers for specific topics, making all participants not only more interconnected, but also more aware of hemispheric challenges. There are, these are just some ideas under, that under the right leadership can help to overcome barriers to military education and provide invaluable service to democracy. Number two, strengthening democratic principles and values. Studying and understanding democratic principles and values, such as civilian control over the military, as an example, will strengthen civil and military relations. Modern professional development programs have important technological tools at their disposal to reach all types of audiences. So we must aim to make the use of everything, reading lists, blogs, podcasts, audiobooks, etc. Universities with strong regional ties, as an example, the Great Florida International University could help in this segment by coordinating efforts with regional academia to develop multi-level programs that from the civilian perspective could, could strengthen military and security practitioners in topics such as democracy, governance, and civil and military relations from tactical to operational to strategic level. Without a doubt, strengthening democratic principles and values in the region will help to develop a more transparent relationship between civilian governments and their military institutions. And finally, as a number three, democratic security partnerships, working together to confront problems that permeate our borders and affect regional relationships is a top priority for democracies. Well-known hemispheric threats are a clear and present danger for democratic consolidation in our region. It is hard and inefficient to fight against these threats individually. In some cases, some countries tend not to recognize the extent of their problems and end up wasting time and resources to confront them. In my view, we are far from having a combined and a cohesive strategy because multilateral approaches are hard to establish. The US Southern Command has always understood this and has done a tremendous job of building coalitions and interagency support groups. But as security problems become more complex and affect more countries, the efforts and resources to resolve these 
issues should involve more democratic partners. The times for isolation and perhaps parochialism is over. It has been proven that these grave hemispheric security challenges could undermine democratic secure institutions and destroy citizens' confidence in the value of democracy and the rule of law. Barbara, as a conclusion, I see the future in general of armed forces in Latin America and the Caribbean with hope and confidence. I see their mission in the next five to seven years moving for a little bit from the conventional approach of border protection towards a more interconnected relationship with neighboring countries. And the pandemic was, of course, a force that brought us in, in, in that direction. To guarantee that this transition leads to an effective containment of modern day challenges, we need to continue to invest in professional military leadership development and look for ways to increase access to quality education. Furthermore, we need to guarantee that these efforts are in tune with democratic principles and values and work in coordination with other democratic nations through security partnerships so we might strengthen so we so that we might strengthen and improve our democratic institutions for generations to come. That is my, my initial uh, participation, Barbara. Okay, well, thank you very much. I am going to ask one and a half follow-up questions because my half question actually ties in with one of the questions from our, our participants. So we'll, we'll get that. But my first follow-up then, we'll, we'll really touch on a little bit of, uh, well, really, what all three of you have have highlighted, uh, partnership. Um, it, it it seems to me what General Mejia, what you're talking about, would be more multilateral efforts, cooperation um, across the region or the individual subregions. And I just wanted to ask uh, how each of you see that, because uh, we 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 have the Organization of American States, the Inter American Defense Board. Uh, the Inter-American Defense College, which facilitates uh, professionalization, uh, professional development of, of officers. Um, what more can we do or how could, would we want to make those institutions more relevant and how? And uh, secondly, how could we uh, have these multinational or regional centers of excellence? Uh, what, what do we need to do to make that happen? And and where do you see challenges and opportunities? Uh, each of you, Admiral Fowler, General Mead, and General Mejia. Uh, uh, Barbara, thanks. I, I, you said Admiral Fowler, but I think we, I'll defer to uh, General Mead or uh, General Mejia to take the lead on this first one. And I recognize uh, the commonality between all of our remarks in some ways. Um, was uh, was very uh, heartening because of the, the confluence of that. I think the confluence of those remarks represents our values, but uh, over to my colleagues. Yes, uh, Barbara, I would like to, to take uh, the lead on uh, this one. Uh, of course, uh, you you initially you, you explain uh, about uh, the security challenges that we have in the region and, and, and really, from narco trafficking to transnational organized crime, deforestation, illegal mining, illegal fishing, among many others. Of course, the challenges are, are, are big uh, and they, they impact the whole region. In the past, we have done a, a specific a, a pilot programs, for example, on creating multinational strategies in the region, for example, against narco trafficking, to confront narco trafficking that uh, led by the US, they, they, they proved to be very, very successful. Uh, one other example, for example, we have worked with the US, the, the Colombian Armed Forces, uh, in order to train military forces in Central America and the Caribbean in order to share doctrine and to share uh, military TTPs, uh, tactic, uh, techniques, tactics, and procedures. So, uh, we need to approach to problems like that in a, with a more multilateral approach because deforestation, for example, affects 
all countries. Illegal fishing, the same. Illegal uh, uh, extraction of minerals, uh, the same. So the strategies, and normally all of this is happening in borders, in jungle borders or jungles that, uh, that are really far from the urban centers and from the control of, of forces, uh, security forces. So we need to work together in order to create these combined and cohesive strategies in order to employ resources better. And with this coordination, we can really expand the action of governments over these challenges. Uh, thank you so much. If I I may offer comments. Yes, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, um, very specifically for the Caribbean, we have uh, um, initiated for a few years now uh, the Caribbean Military Academy, uh, which is intended to be um, a institution anchored in the Caribbean. Um, with campuses in more than one Caribbean countries and providing training to um, small uh, developing uh, militaries um, across the world. We uh, are partnering with our larger partners to develop the various programs, primarily US, Canada, and the United Kingdom to develop a number of programs that are, are delivered to small island states, not just within the region. Um, NCO and officer development, strategic level training, more specific things like establishing a cyber institute. And we are already well advanced. The main campus is in Jamaica, but we are well advanced in look, having discussions to have another campus in Trinidad. Uh, we have um, mobile training teams that um, are available to go to different areas. Uh, we have assisted Cayman and so on. So there's a very specific uh, institution, um, uh, a few years old, that's looking to help with professional military education in the region and for small island states. And I want to support Admiral Fallas point about the importance of exercises, uh, because of course it is one thing to say that you have um, sheer challenges, and therefore we must train together, but inevitably we have to practice what we train to be able to work together in responding to the various challenges, whether they be natural or man-made. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, bo bo both of you, uh, all three of you, um, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to go to one of our um, participant questions combined with some of my own question, which in it has to do with Venezuela and it has to do with China, Iran and Russia. So Admiral Fowler, you mentioned trust being very important, global interconnectedness. Well, we've all mentioned this and um, also the partnerships and uh, General Mejia, you, you mentioned some professional development and sharing. I'd, I'd like to comment on uh, what we've seen with China expanding into some mill to mill. It's not just commercial. Um, we see a lot of exchanges happening and with some questions. And, and I, I don't really need you to comment on that per se, but there are there is anecdotal evidence of that. Uh, with the partnerships and the trust being so important. And I think Admiral Fowler, you mentioned um, more sharing, more education, more exchanges, Intel sharing. Um, so there are things where we see the trust in our, our trusted partners is, is put at risk because if we have China also involved in some of the networks, um, perhaps 
providing the architecture that our shared intel travels on, we sort of lose some trust in the region. And I want to emphasize that in saying this, it's not that it's an either or uh, question in terms of China, the United States, or any of these other actors, but it, it is a, a, a true concern if we trust our partners and they trust us, we also have to trust the infrastructure we all operate on. Um, throwing, throwing that out there a bit, and let me kind of go back to, I, I had the question better organized. Um, so, so with that, and, and, and again, also, you know, with, with that, is our trust at risk if, if we have China more involved in the infrastructure in the region uh, and do we lose some trust with more mill to mill training? And does it, and, and, and this is a, really a question, how, what is the impact on the professionalism of the forces and the interoperability um, if they are trained in China, which is not a democracy? Uh, I'll throw that out there. Uh, it, it's perhaps not the best uh, well-written question. And then I will combine it with a question, uh, so it, it leaves it open for you to answer in many ways. Um, one of our uh, participants has asked about the Maduro alliance with China, Iran, and Russia as a part of a goal to undermine US geostrategic position as the only world power in the Americas. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just get there. Go ahead. Yeah, Barbara, thank you. I'll jump on there. 10 questions there. Yes. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Important series of questions and centered on trust and trusted relationships and partnerships. And then uh, going back to how both my colleagues answered the last question, I think it's it, it very important to illuminate for military professionals to take the intelligence, share it in a trusted environment. And sometimes it's just sharing information and illuminate it in sticky, factual ways so that our elected officials, our democratic leaders, and our people understand what's at stake. And Venezuela is an excellent example where all the global security threats come together in a way that are undermining hemispheric security, the region security, and global security, uh, and we have not taken enough action. You have Russia and China both acting in their own interests, as nations do, but acting in their own interests counter to international norms uh, to prop up the dictatorship of Maduro, particularly in the information space, where China has imported their own version of social societal control to Venezuela in the form of uh, you know, internet control, uh, social media cards, fatherland cards, and, uh, and has consistently blocked any international progress uh, to solving the, the crisis in Venezuela. And so when we look at China and we look at the partnerships and we deal with PRC, the fact that they're the number one trading partner for most uh, nations in the hemisphere as well as the US. So you can't ignore it, you have to deal with it realistically, eyes wide open. And I never asked a single partner to make a choice, US, uh, China, but when you look at this, uh, you have to say there's got to be lines drawn when it comes to uh, the relationships established with China, particularly in, in uh, the IT space. And that's where China's taken a, a page in, 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 on international organizations and marched forward. And yes, we're at risk if we cede the information space, the technical backbone of 5G, uh, to China because everything in China is state run and all that information is being fed back. And so when we talk about the, the thing that will drive more international cooperation, more utilization of the excellent regional and national organizations that exist, it is threat recognition. And the PRC is the number one threat to democracy and freedom in the 21st century. We've got to do more to eliminate why that is so. And 
still deal with the economic might of China in a positive way. That is the complex security question of our time. And information sharing is a key step in moving forward to solve that dilemma. Barbara, from, from my, my view, uh, yeah, I, I, I talked at the beginning uh, about three ways to strengthening the armed forces in, in Latin America and the Caribbean by using you know, professional military development, leader, uh, leadership development, uh, strengthening democratic principles and values, and democratic security partnerships. So, so all of these is around the concept of democracy. And that is why we look in the case of Colombia as the US, at the US as the trusted partner and ally. So, so this, is, this is very important because we, we fight and we leave our military careers because of these values, because of these principles. And we need to continue to be completely, you know, to hold to them very, very tight. In the case of Colombia specifically, we have suffered the consequences of having a, a, a neighbor that supports narco trafficking, that supports insurgency. As a matter of fact, 60% of ELN command and control structures are, are located in Venezuela. Uh, many of ELN fronts are there the same thing for dissidences, et cetera. And it's not, yes, that they are located there, is that they receive support from government institutions and they make our fight for democracy and for security more and more difficult. Of course, there is a big influence of China and Russia, just to mention uh, some in Venezuela. Uh, and of course, uh, as you know, this government they have employed you know very very big uh, resources in the billions of dollars and uh, numbers uh, buying you know military systems and military hardware etc uh, to see their country economically uh, you know weaken at the end they they wasted all this money in my opinion for nothing because now their economy is completely weakened. So uh, we, we need to be very serious about these threats and understand that we can only confront these threats under democratic governments, under clear democratic policies in which human rights and international humanitarian law are a very important piece of all of this. And at the very end, uh, understanding that only by working together and creating these alliances, we can really uh, uh, confront those challenges. In my opinion, democracy is the glue of all of that. Uh, and the US, in my opinion, in the case of Colombia, is the trusted partner uh, uh, in this century to move forward in that direction, Barbara. Thank you, sir. Um, I will, uh, unless anyone wants to add anything, I'm going to kind of pull the thread on that a little bit and finish the second half of the question re regarding uh, China and Venezuela and trust. Um, the question states, if Maduro and his allies plan to add Colombia to the multipolar alliance, uh, if, if it succeeds that plan, if there is a plan, are we in risk of, at risk by sending military assets to Colombia. And I think what this question is uh, referring to is the upcoming election uh, with the um, more left candidate, uh, Petro, uh, for, for presidency. Um, if he wins the presidency, will that damage the relationship with the United States? So will that damage trust? Would Colombia become a part of a multipolar alliance with Venezuela? I think that's you know we there are a couple of questions we have to ask for, uh, ask first uh, with that. Uh, but it's an interesting question certainly. Um, but I, I think we need to kind of analyze it a little. 
Uh, and I imagine I, I'm the one to respond first. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid so, um, unless Admiral Fowler wants to talk about U.S. Colombia relations. Okay. But I'm, I, I'll be right. happy, to, but I'll let, let the ambassador start. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, this is a very provo provocative uh, uh, question. Uh, of course, we really have to wait to see the results of the elections. Of course, eh, 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 in Colombia, eh, as a democracy, we, we have to see eh, what is going to happen, and, and we have two rounds to go. So we still have to, we still have time for that. But eh, in my opinion, eh, in the hypothetical case that eh, Mr. Eh, Gustavo Petro becomes the president of Colombia, of course, this will present a, a test to Colombian democratic institutions. So we are going to be able to see what have we been building for decades. If we have the, you know, the clear check and balances that will keep our democracy in the right path. I understand that uh, uh, last year, a uh, social protest uh, uh, and all these riots that, that you saw happening in the region and in Colombia uh, uh, demonstrated, you know, uh, uh, social, uh, 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 not only uh, revolt against the government, but, but also uh, the, the social problems after the, pa the pandemic became more uh, clear and more a dangerous in general for, for our society. So, so I really believe that Colombian institutions are strong. We have a strong Congress, a strong judiciary, a very highly developed judicial courts. Of course, we are not there yet. We are in a path for democratic consolidation. But I, I really, I don't see Colombia going in that direction. We already choose our path. And for example, we became members of OCDE. We became global security partners of NATO. President Biden just gave us, you know, this new uh, title of uh, non-NATO strategic partner is a strategic security partner of the US. So, so I think all of these that we have built for the years it has demonstrated uh, that, that it has produced a lot of good for our country. Our country, despite all problems, all difficulties, all social challenges, our country is much, much better than 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago. Uh, uh, our country continues to fight against poverty and inequality. Our country continues to fight uh, to have a stronger economy. As a matter of fact, today, after the pandemic, is one of the strongest economies in the region. So we are in the right path. So to derail that, in my opinion, is not very smart. It's not the right way to go. And on the contrary, we are daily, we are seeing this millions of Venezuelan citizens in the streets of Colombia, begging for food and trying to, to make their living. So Colombians are seeing the mirror of Venezuela on the daily basis. They destroy one of the richest countries of the Americas uh, uh, under these crazy policies, in, in, my, in my opinion. And, and Colombians, they don't want that. Colombians, they, they want more social investment. They want uh, to, to, to fight uh, with, with a stronger fist against inequality. But, but I, 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 I cannot see Colombia uh, moving in that extreme direction in which we will be part of this multipolar uh, alliance to lose. Barbara, if I may, um, on that, and Alberto's excellent words, uh, the glue uh, for the democracies is values, as my colleagues has my colleague has said, and 
that has also been the fuel that has built strong institutions, uh, strong militaries, strong security forces, strong institutions across all branches of government, and strong democracies have those checks and balances built in over time. I'm a I'm positive that we will stand together as democracies and well, weather the storm of, of the ups and downs of any political instability, as well as uh, other wannabe great powers that try to impose a different version of democracy that won't look anything like what any of us have, have enjoyed and fought so hard for. And one of the keys, I had the opportunity yesterday to swear in uh, 35 new uh, Marines and Navy personnel at the Pen University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, and um, Pennsylvania State University. And you know, it's inherent in the oaths that we swear. And the, my colleagues here today, that are militaries and other professional militaries across the region. And we're swearing those oaths to constitutions and values, not any one elected official. And while we respect the elected process across the board, uh, we also represent that in the end of the day, uh, we are aligning our institutions to values that are enshrined in constitutions. And we have judicial systems and legislative systems and systems of government that are resilient. And I'm, I'm a believer. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, if, if no one else wants to add to that question, move to uh, another well, question one is related. I'm going to do two questions that are not related to each other. And I think the, the first question had to do with democracy. Oh, my goodness. And there's a lot more questions than I saw before. Um, and, and I think it perhaps the answer might not be on this panel uh, that uh, don't we think the whole concept of democracy has failed to provide the needed development, particularly for the developing world. And, and I would refer our, our participants uh, to the UN Economic Commission on Latin America and the Caribbean and the statistics that show up until the pandemic, much of at least the Americas was coming out of, ex, you know, the numbers of extreme poverty were down very much or almost eliminated and, and poverty figures were uh, incredibly reduced. Uh, but does anyone want to comment on that, the concept of democracy as failing in the Western Hemisphere? And, and the other, well, I'll go with that first, uh, or, or not. Okay. The uh, other, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do not agree, but uh, you could understand cynics who are of the view that this might be the case. Um, so you look at China that has a very notable hybrid model and um, you could argue that before COVID and certainly over the past two decades have developed significantly economically and so on. Uh, so if you recall, when I made my comments, I, I did say that it, it is really important not just to know that democracy is the best approach um, to um, you know, the, the existence of humanity and, and our governance, but it is important to let it be clearly demonstrated as best as we can. And I did make the point that uh, the, the more successful um, democracies must, um, if they want to not have this cynical question asked, the more successful democracies must support the, the more fragile democracies as best as possible. So the entire model of this ideological approach is, 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 is very clearly um, you know, successful. And uh, just going back to the previous question about confidence, that's a part of it, because, of course, if in our national interest, we seem to hopscotch uh, in terms of who we support, we may say that a state is uh, bad or not doing the right thing today and tomorrow because the challenges change, we adjust. We just have to be careful as well. I mean, 
that's done no doubt for for good necessary um, reasons, but we have to be careful uh, to what extent that we, we, in all our actions, demonstrate that we do have confidence in democracy and and we will invest in it and we will support the more fragile democracies so democracies so that the entire um, ideological approach is not questioned because there are so many um, you know counter examples that one could point at that would be what I'd offer. Okay, sir, thank you. Um, I'm going to throw out uh, two questions. Um, in my mind, they're a little related, but they're, they're well, yes. Uh, we'll go ahead with uh, one. How do the panelists see the impacts and consequences of the war between Russia and Ukraine in Latin America and the Caribbean with uh, regarding defense matter, matters? So what are the impacts? And we have another question sort of related. Um, so we know that some of our partners were taken aback by our meeting with Venezuela in the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Will our partners see increased cooperation with Venezuela as a slight, the US choosing European countries and their interests above this region's interests? So, you know, this kind of gets at trust, uh, the, the, the US lifting of sanctions in Venezuela and, and also the US focus on the Ukraine-Russia conflict, does that undermine trust in Latin America? And then the other question was simply, uh, how does this uh, conflict affect um, our, uh, affect Latin America uh, in terms of defense? Uh, let's see. And, and then you, this question continues with uh, some dissent and talking, uh, talking about anti-West versus pro-Russia sentiment, uh, will this set back our relations? So I, I'd go back to simplifying it to uh, the U.S. dealing with the Ukraine-Russia crisis. How is it impacting the U.S., the trust in the U.S. in the region? And in general, how does the Russia-Ukraine Ukraine conflict, not crisis, it's a conflict, um, impact in Latin America and the Caribbean? General Meade, is your is your mic on, or would you like to take that, or anyone? Okay, Barbara, let, let, let me let me start by, uh, of course, uh, there is a, a clear and visible uh, economic impact of this war, or in, in the region. Uh, for example, uh, you you know that, for example, in the case of Colombia, we do import some some uh, agricultural goods and uh, fertilizers uh, from uh, Ukraine uh, and from this uh, region in general so 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 uh, there is an evident impact there militarily speaking in my view uh, what has happened there uh, is 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 a demonstration that democracies should and must be united. In the case of Europe, as you know, NATO has only become stronger. And now with the request made by, by Finland and Sweden to become members of NATO, it, it's just a clear demonstration of, of a countries that for more than a century were in, in, in the, in his uh, neutrality position, now they shift because there are dangers out there and dangers against democracy, dangers against freedom. So when we have to bring that back into our region because uh, uh, freedom and liberty is not for free. So we need to continue and we will, must work together, despite you know, political differences in order to protect our countries, our democracies, and to avoid the consequences of war. A war in the region uh, uh, cannot happen. Uh, poor countries cannot be involved in, in war. 
this will completely stop any development, any economic progress. So we need to create the necessary measures in order to avoid all of that. And in the case of a region, Barbara, yes, we, we don't have state to state uh, problems uh, that, that bring countries close to the world, but we have a lot of very serious security challenges. And those challenges that we are confronting are really major. For example, Colombia today is carrying the burden of having more than 2 million Venezuelans in our country. So the burden of all of these over our economy is big. At the same time, you have over that transnational organized crime, illegal migration, et cetera, et cetera. So, so all of these put any democratic government at risk. And that is why we only need to be more professional. We only need to believe more in democratic principles and values. And we only believe that we cannot solve all of this alone. And, and that is why we need trusted uh, partners in the region uh, and especially a very close relationship with the, with the, with the United States. Regarding and concerning the, the, the US lifting san sanctions on, on Venezuela, uh, uh, of course, I, I only know what we all have read in, in the media, but, I, but I, in my opinion, it's a very pragmatic approach. Uh, they, they tried some strategy in, in the past years and it didn't work. Uh, uh, so so they, need, they need to look for new ways to approach to the problem. And perhaps this new way could help a, 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 a regime change in Venezuela. Uh, for Colombia, it, it is very, very important if this regime change uh, of course, uh, uh, Venezuela only creates a big deal of problems to Colombia. We need a trusted neighbor on the other side of the border. Venezuela used to be our main commercial partner. Today, everything related to our relationship, commercial relationship is zero. So we all are losing our economy is, is, is weakened because of that. Of course, the good side of that is that we were forced to look for new markets and for new partners all over the world. That, that is very important and very good. But uh, the lifting of sanctions in Venezuela perhaps could accelerate the changes that we all are expecting and waiting for. And, and, and this could be a, a clear example in the case of, of Cuba uh, and Nicaragua in the region. Thank you, sir. Um, we have exactly three minutes left for closing comments. I'm gonna quickly highlight a few questions I didn't get to if you feel the desire to bring them in your closing content, comments. One was uh, your opinion on the cases where military forces have been used for internal security, examples in Central America, Brazil, elsewhere. Uh, also um, a reference to using the terms left and right. And I'm not sure I'm understanding the question exactly. Uh, it has to do it with uh, geopolitical goals, how, how we tend to use those terms. And I think it is important to note, we tend to, in the United States, Tend, and others uh, tend to conflate left with non uh, anti US, which uh, I don't conflate those two terms. And I, you know, you can be friends with a leftist government. Uh, so I'll leave that there is one of the questions. And lastly, uh, we talk about Russia and China. Go back to uh, President Kennedy's Alliance for Progress. And the question is, well, what have we done since the Alliance for Progress? Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to that. Closing comments, if you can touch on any of those, awesome. Understand uh, we have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, go, go ahead uh, in, in uh, Admiral Fowler, uh, we'll go in with the same original. Order. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for an excellent discussion and uh, well done uh, on articulating the importance of democracy last week. 
my wife and I, Martha, were in St. Louis and we visited the Gateway National Park. The gateway, those arches represent the gateway to the West. And, and uh, recognizing that a lot of people congregated in St. Louis in its time seeking hope. And really, when I look at the arches, I see them as a gateway to freedom. And when I think about the importance of our uh, security institutions, they, they keep that gateway open. Uh, and the gateway to freedom, democracies, is under assault. And that's the lesson we see in Ukraine. And the lesson we see in how we deal and how we navigate with the PRC going forward. Professional military institutions and leaders that value human rights are, are key to ensuring democratic institutions may, maintain uh, and that that gateway to freedom stays open. And we've got to invest more in those institutions. Thank you, sir. Um, General Mead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to say it was a pleasure participating in this panel and I look forward to the remainder of the conference. Uh, you know, thanking FIU and the entire team again. Um, in terms of the point made about the use of armed forces in internal security, certainly Jamaica has been experiencing that for decades. Um, as I said, as a small island developing state, we do not have the luxury of um, having a defense force sitting uh, awaiting traditional defense threats. And so we have been actively engaged in internal security and other domestic issues that require an armed um, service or an organized um, service that can manage logistics and so on in terms of uh, you know, HADR response. We do have a civilian organization for responding to crises, but the military has the resources and the leadership and the logistics skills. So we do do that um, uh, quite significantly. And, you know, I just want to close by saying that uh, we need to balance our expectations of our partners in that um, uh, countries must consider their national interest. It's, it's not, uh, we can't expect a country to ignore its own national interests uh, uh, to support regional or other interests. However, each individual country, uh, no doubt will recognize that uh, regional and international security means national security. So it, 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 it is a balance that is required. And uh, certainly for Jamaica's part, I can't speak for the government, but I can repeat what the prime minister has said that our values are not debatable. You know, we have values that are aligned with democratic principles. And so we expect to have partnerships with other like-minded countries. And uh, we will, you know, I think continue to support all efforts to reinforce and strengthen democracies in the region and around the world. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thank you, Barbara. General Mejia. Yes, thank you very much for, for this invitation. Uh, and of course, when we speak about strong military forces and strong security forces, we are not talking about strong to attack our population and, or to break human rights. We are talking strong, professionally speaking, so they can really understand and protect democracy to me that is the key if you have a higher level of professional development within your forces you will have as a result of that and and, and samuel huntington mentioned it that you have stronger civil and military relations and especially stronger transparency between civilian institutions and the military in the case of colombia we have involved we have been involved for years in internal uh, security. Uh, uh, we have been trying to develop a doctrine that we call a multi-mission army that can tackle different problems. But for example, in order for a, a, a military service to support uh, the police or to support civilian institutions, everything must be based on professional development, the training to do that, the specific doctrine and the regulations and, uh, and the, the framework to do that under the law. And that is the only way we should 
growth by being more legitimate and by being more democratic. Thank you, sir. And thank you, gentlemen. I, I do apologize for going four minutes over. Uh, I'm sure that I will get kicked out of the military very soon. So um, I, I thank you all for really rich conversation and uh, great uh, response to the questions. A lot of great questions we did not get to. Thank you again. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you very, very much, Generals Mejia, Mead, and Admiral Fowler. It was a great pleasure seeing you all. Outstanding participations as usual. So we're very grateful for your coming to our conference. 